Everybody say amen. amen. Oh, my goodness. The work that we do as chaplains. The work that we do as chaplains. Obviously, war creates crisis. I mean, you can't get any more obvious than a crisis that's created by war, which you've seen in the video and you've heard from John's, Jonathan's testimony. War is a disaster on a massive scale, isn't it? But so are many other disasters. Chaplain Jonathan illustrated the kind of crisis that produces terror, anxiety, fear, hopelessness in the lives of people. Just like that mother at the end of the video who lost her son and is now alone. It's no different for the mother who lost her son or loved one to an accident or to a fire or to a storm. It's no different from the person across the street who just lost their job. It's the same for the person suffering their own personal crisis that will rob them of hope. Such things like these are happening all around you every day. If only we would have eyes to see. Some of you here tonight are experiencing anxiety, fear, hopelessness, loss. And you need Jesus to calm your storm and restore your hope. We're surrounded by storms of life. They're experienced by every single person in your community. Are you ready to bring his peace to their storms? You encounter a man who is grieving the loss of job and livelihood. His company is closing after 30 years of employment. His pension plan has gone bankrupt. He's losing everything that he has. He doesn't know how he's going to provide for his family or for his wife in retirement. He's considering suicide now as a response. He can't look at his wife in the eyes. You enter a room in the nursing home and your senses are assaulted by the smell because the patient's bowels have released as she sits in her wheelchair in her filth, weeping in terrible discomfort and embarrassment. A couple has just been disowned by their own daughter who they love so dearly. She suffers from gender dysphoria and believes that she really is a man and not a woman. And she's told them, since you cannot, since you will not affirm that I am a man, I do not ever want to see you again. You are dead to me. You are no longer my parents. That's personal for Virginia and me. That describes our youngest daughter. We've been still suffering that grief for three years now. And if you think, if any of you think that you have any words that you could say to Virginia and I in the moment of our grief when our daughter had given us that announcement that would help us and fix us, oh, you just need Jesus. Get away from me. You can't fix people. The nursing station at the hospital asks you to bring spiritual care to a couple in the room, room number five, just down the hall, who just lost their baby in childbirth. You walk in and encounter a lesbian couple holding the linen-wrapped body of their dead child, wiping tears from their eyes and shaking with grief. And you introduce yourself, and they plead with you. They plead with you, chaplain, please baptize our baby so that he can go to heaven. I would submit to you that's not the time for a theological treatise on what baptism is. You stand with the grandparents and you watch emergency personnel and cadaver dogs searching through the smoking remains of an entire town that has been devastated by wildfires. They're searching for the remains of their children and grandchildren who were burned alive in the fire. School shootings, bombings, storms, fires, floods, loss of health, loss of 
freedom due to incarceration or many other ways. And so much pain. Every person faces crisis and experiences grief in this life. Grief is so prevalent that we hardly even notice it in our society today. Anxiety, fear, uncertainty, suicidal thoughts, confusion, PTSD, anger, and rage. It's all around us like a storm in a sea of despair. Doing the work that Jesus sends us to do in this world of woe, well, it's challenging to say the least. It's impossible, really. Impossible unless he is working in you and through you to the people he's sending you to. And if you think you're ready for it, think again. When Jesus took his disciples on a training mission across the Sea of Galilee to minister to the Gerasenes, they must have been unbelievably uncomfortable. This was a land filled with unclean pigs. The Gerasenes were unclean people. And every place you walked would be filled with the stench of pigs. The air would be filled with pigs pig dust that you'd be breathing into your mouth. It covered the ground, making it impossible for a Jew to remain ceremonially clean. It would have been a horror to them. And in that dark place is where they encountered the frightening and terrible assault of a demon-possessed man that no one could control. That man was tormented by evil. And Jesus calls you and me to go with him to bring his sacred presence into the storms that these people are experiencing in their lives. This is what we are called to do. We are Christian chaplains. We bring his peace to their storms. We work In enemy-occupied territory. And the Bible calls it the field of harvest. It's also called the mission field. And it's located right across the street from where you live. You're surrounded by it. But we cannot, listen to me, we cannot bring his peace unless we ourselves are at peace. We cannot bring calm unless we are calm. We cannot bring his sacred presence unless he dwells in us. Without genuine belief, without true confidence only in Jesus, we ourselves will perish in our own storms long before we are ever successful at rebuking the storms that are being experienced by others in this world where we live. It starts here. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus engages in some profound teaching to those who would be his disciples, who would join him in the hard work of ministry that he wants us to join him in as well. In a moment, we're going to read that scripture together, but let's first consider the point that Jesus is making in this chapter of Mark as we lead up to the scripture For this evening, Mark chapter 4 begins with the parable of one who sows seeds, which illustrates the need for evangelism, for we must also be spreaders of good news. Then he explains the purpose of the parables to be a means of profound truth that only can be understood by those who believe. After all, the secret of the kingdom of God is given to those who believe. And then he asks in that passage, do you have ears to hear? Then in rapid succession, event after event, Mark continues with illustrations, all of them to highlight what kind of a life 
it would look like if we lived for Jesus. The parable of a lamp that should not be hidden under a basket. For it's expected that his light in us will shine brightly for everyone to see. So pay attention, he says, to what you hear and believe because it will influence your life. And that life will be seen by everyone, either kingdom-focused or worldly-focused. Where's your focus? Your emotions and your storms will tell you the tale of where you're focused. And then the parable of a seed that is growing to illustrate the steady influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, producing steady growth in faith, while we learn steadily, day by day, to live new life in Christ, as expected of those who believe, even though we can't explain the changes that are taking place in us except to point to Jesus. So trust me, everybody has a story. But you only have a testimony if Jesus is the hero of your story. And then the profound parable of the mustard seed growing into a large bush to illustrate the extravagant growth and progress that Jesus expects is going to happen in the life of a believer over time and continuing until we take our final breath. I thank God I'm not the same knucklehead I was five years ago, but if I'm still the same knucklehead five years from now as I am today, then shame on me and you too. Progress, progress. That's what the parable of the mustard seed is about. And all of these parables provide us with a vision of what life as a believer on mission with Jesus, like a family together, looks like. Sort of life, sort of like serving together as a crew on a sailing ship at sea. And we would submit to you and we train our chaplains. And if you were to join us as a chaplain, we say there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger chaplain. Listen, if you're trying to be spiritual, trying to be a believer, trying to be a Christian, you're just like a pioneer, and the pioneers get shot by the Indians. Listen, you can't survive as a Christian alone. An isolated Christian is a paralyzed Christian. If you're paralyzed, then look around. Where is everybody? Where's your family? Where is Jesus? Where's your community? Where's your accountability group? Where are your people who love Jesus who can encourage you when you're having a storm? And if you don't learn to live life as a chaplain in family, as the family of God, on mission with him to the people he's sending you to, then you're never, ever going to be able to bring his peace to them because you're going to be doing it alone. And you don't have the power to do it alone. No Lone Ranger Christians at Christian Chaplains and Coaching. So we, we, we are expected to learn how to do this life serving together like a crew on a sailing ship at sea, together with Jesus, truly believing, actually living out our faith, Trusting God no matter how hard it gets. Proclaiming the good news. Showing others that the kingdom of God really is standing within their reach. Bringing his sacred presence to rebuke their storms as we are making progress at walking the walk we talk while putting that ever-changing life on display so that they can see what life with Jesus is like. Then Mark takes them, or Jesus takes them on a journey, according to Mark, to the place of the Gerasene demoniac where they are going to encounter their own storm of uncertainty, causing them to fear for their very lives. So where is Jesus in your storms? Where is your faith found during your own crisis? What gives you hope? What gives you confidence in this God that we say we believe in? Do you respond with faith or will you collapse in a panic like an empty burlap bag? Consider now Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, which will be on the screen. This is where Jesus calms the storm. 
Do we have the screen up there? We do. Good, thank you. Verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling Now, these were experienced sailors who were engaged at this moment in the hard work of surviving a storm at sea. Clearly, they were afraid they would die as the boat was in danger of capsizing. They had reached the end of their ability to survive that storm on their own. Clearly, they needed saved, and so do we. Where is Jesus in your storms? Verse 38, but he was in the stern, asleep, on a cushion. And they woke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not even care that we're perishing? Apparently, Jesus isn't worried about the storms that we're facing in this life. Apparently, he's so filled with peace that even a hurricane can't disturb his peace and rest. Just who is this Jesus that we call Lord and Savior? How can we know that we can trust him? How can we know that we can trust Jesus during our storms, and help someone else to know that as well. Well, in verse 39, it says, And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still, and the wind ceased. And there was great calm. And Jesus said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And here the word translated afraid is the Greek word delos, and it means to be cowardly. Why are you acting like cowards in the face of the storm that God brought to you for a purpose? So that all things can work for the good? Because God loves you? And what you're going to become as a result of this storm is going to be stronger on the other side. And it's going to let you be able to do something as a chaplain that you would never ever be able to do had it not been for that storm. Why are you acting like cowards? Where is your faith? He says. And then in verse 41. Now listen to this. And then they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Make note of that. They were filled now with great fear. This is from the word phobos, and it means to be panicked and terrified. Surely they were afraid of dying in that storm, but their fear went from cowardice to terror. What on earth were they terrified of in that moment of calm with Jesus standing in their boat? Well, they had been taught, according to the law of Moses, that you cannot see the face of God and survive the encounter. You cannot see God and live. It's impossible. It will consume you. It's why there was a veil put into the Holy of Holies. To separate us from God. You can't come into his presence. You can't do it. You'll die. That's what they were raised to believe. And it was true until Jesus. So who then is this? Even the wind and the sea and the waves obey him. Well, the answer should be obvious. Only God himself has the ability to change the course of nature itself. Only God could calm that storm by the command of his voice alone. Who is in our boat? Who is in your boat? It caused a moment of terror for those Jews. Is Jesus in your boat right now? 
in your storm? Or better yet, have you climbed aboard the boat that Jesus is in? Going where he is leading, do you trust him enough to lead you through your storms? Trust me. You're going to face storms. You have faced storms, and you'll face more of them. The veil that separated us from the presence of God has been torn. Jesus is God in person. And he now dwells among us and in us, but only if we believe. Only if we believe. And your life will demonstrate that belief by how you live, by how you respond, by how you put his peace on display for others when you're experiencing a storm. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know Jesus? And if so, then you have, as chaplains, the responsibility to live for him while being engaged in this hard work. What work? Well, as sailors on a ship at sea, it's the hard work of search and rescue operations in this sea of despair in which we live. But we ourselves must first be rescued and our storms rebuked by the God of all creation. But if you do not truly believe and if you do not truly trust Jesus during your own storms and crisis, it will not be possible for you to speak his peace to anybody else. In Christ is our salvation and our faith. And we know that he dwells inside of each of us. Maybe it feels like he's asleep. Maybe we need to ask him to wake up. We have to go deep in our faith and belief in Christ. We must be at peace to bring peace. Are you? Does your life put changed life on display while you minister to the hurting people that you are called by him to serve? My dear friends, as believers... In Jesus Christ, you carry his authority to rebuke the storms of crisis and bring his peace to their chaos. It may not result in the storm going away, but we can at least bring his sacred presence into their storm and let them know they are not alone to deal with it by themselves. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. An isolated Christian is a paralyzed Christian. We need to be there for each other. Team up, family up, help each other. Go on mission with Jesus. Peace begins with you and Jesus. And then us on mission together where he leads. Be at peace. Trust him in your trial. He will not let you down. Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you so much for this time that we've had together this weekend to speak with each other and to you and to learn about your mission and your path, your will and your way, to be reminded of the importance that we are first and foremost Christians and the mission is what Jesus says the mission is. It is not what the world says the mission is. Give us faith, O oh Father, and teach us, O oh God, not so much to pray that you will bless the things that we are doing, but rather that you will help us to do the things that you are blessing. Fill us with your wisdom and your peace and your love and help us to come together in a way that will make a difference in the lives of others. We give this to you and we ask for your help as we come together as chaplains on mission with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.